You're listening to the TGTS Radio Network. And now, TGTS is on the air. This is the greatest talk show on Block Talk Radio. Greatest talk show. From oblivion. From oblivion. From oblivion. And now, here's your host, your host Mark, Mark, the Arcturian. I'm Mark the Arcturian, Captain USS Arcturus, Galaxy Class, Multidimensional Drive. The USS Enterprise. 2012, big movie came out. I couldn't make the movie. I had to send it over to Roland Emmerich and say, this is what it's going to look like to make the movie. So now, but we have this idea, it happens like that in one day, right? Big cataclysm. Oh, we'll get there, don't worry. But right now, it's slow. The flooding in Jakarta and southern India. Six years ago, this man's home was, well, out there somewhere. It's, all, it's just like you left the water on in the bathtub a little too long, and it's overflowing a little, and it's rising slowly. These these shots of India, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Jakarta, they're fascinating and real, and they're now. So we'll get to that point where it's a big thing, you know, and when California falls in the water, and you ask any geologist, it's not if, it's just when. Uh, in, in the business, we have a a line we use, when California falls in the water, remember, it's Andrea's fault. Thank God that can't happen here. Stay tuned. What does an OPA have to do with a Wahoo? What do the melting ice caps have to do with the heliophysical axial flux and the photon belt? What's a photon belt and who says we're in one? What do the melting ice caps have to do with the photon belt? What does magnetic north, being 500 miles to the southeast, have to do with El Nino? And we're going to cover why El Nino is a joke and didn't cause any of this. We're going to cover why the eastern states are drowning and the coast is toast. We'll cover quakes, global tectonic motion, the New Madrid Fault. I don't have time to cover What's with all the fracking quakes? There are no fracking quakes. Injection wastewater wells. Yeah, that's the pitchforks and torches. No, it's not the injection water wells either. Turn on the USGS hazard map, and oh look, that's where all the earthquakes are. Smack dab in the middle of the Wabash Fault Zone, which, BTW, sits right next to her big sister, the New Madrid Fault larger than the San Andreas Fault and the Cascadia Subduction Zone combined. And she's waking up. Runs from Chicago, Lake Erie in Chicago, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, and quite soon may rip the entire United States in half. You may have seen the maps right down the Mississippi. But don't have time to cover that. We'll go over the Ecuador-Japan quakes. Are they related? We're going to look at extreme weather, global flooding, sea level rise, and why we've shattered every known temperature record, both hottest and coldest, for the 12 straight months in a row over 2015, which is the hottest year on record since 2014, and if there's any end in sight. What does some ice in Siberia have to do with the sixth mass extinction event? We are now in, and how long Earth will be able, at this ever-increasing rate of all these, be able to sustain human, plant, and animal life. 
And why didn't anyone know this was coming? And if they did, who knew? And why didn't they tell us? And if they did tell us, how come we haven't heard about it? Why, you'd have to be a master shaman to navigate all these signs. Well, you're in luck. We're going to cover all these and more, and you hear it first and only right here on The Greatest Talk Show. Don't touch that dial. These, these shots of India, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Jakarta, they're fascinating and real, and they're now. Thank God that can't happen here. Stay tuned. The East Coast of the United States is drowning. Fantastic flooding in West Virginia. At the same time, Oklahoma, nine counties, state of emergency. Louisiana, losing a football field of land every 48 minutes. St. Louis, Missouri. Phoenix, Arizona. Houston. We do have a problem. And while the Eastern US is drowning, the West Coast is burning, both ways, literally, we're on fire, and triple digits. A mere couple of weeks ago, mid-June 2016, magnitude 5.2 Borrego Springs, California, 20 miles south of where I'm currently sitting, along the San Jacinto fault line, the wake-up call of the immense pressure on the western coast of North America right now, a lot of it from the Ecuadorian quakes, the Chilean quakes, the motion of the South American plate, and we'll cover that. It was such a jolt, I sprang to my feet, claws in the ceiling, ready to grab my bug out bag. But listen, 15 miles north of Borrego Springs, the San Jacinto Fault dead ends, pun intended, smack dab in the San Andreas Fault Zone, 10 miles east of where I'm sitting. Of course, it takes three hours to get there on these freeways. So here I am, front row seat, and as you know, I look at both sides. I'm not high in the Rockies anymore, but I am farther away from Yellowstone. See, maybe that's my silver lining. And now I am sitting on top of the San Andreas Fault. I think it's because I used so many San Andreas scenes in my films. Universe says, hey, how about a front row seat and some beachfront property? So we'll get to that point where it's a big thing, you know, when, when California falls in the water, and you ask any geologist, it's not if, it's just when. This quake lasted 11 minutes and spawned a tsunami 82 feet high that leveled Hilo, Hawaii, 8,000 miles away. 8,000 miles away. Professor, do you think something that intense could happen here? Well, the San Andreas Fault runs right up the spine of California. It's the demarcation line between two tectonic plates that are constantly moving and add to that the fact that it's supposed to happen every 150 years and we're about 100 years overdue i'd say it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when so i want to keep going with this east west dichotomy why is the west on fire and burning up and the east coast underwater let's start in louisiana as I mentioned, Louisiana currently loses approximately a football field of land every 48 minutes due to sea level rise. Right next door, Florida, the sea level rise is four times the national average. Louisiana Highway 1 floods every day at high tide. Same with downtown Miami. To adapting to the various consequences of a changing planet. 
During the summit, the president even pointed to Miami Beach. I, you, know, you go down to Miami and when it's flooding at high tide on a sunny day, the fish are swimming through the middle of the streets. Um, you know, that, there's a cost to that. These shots from 1932, this is what it used to look like, here's what it looks like now. 1932, this is what it used to look like, this is what it looks like now. They've even had to change their road signs. Let's go over to Houston, also on the Gulf of Mexico. OMG. Not just once, twice, third year in a row. These are incredible shots. Watch, they're very credible shots. They all come from credible sources, like CNN. Phoenix, I know a lot of you have seen these, but I want to rub our noses in it for just another minute or two. St. Louis, Missouri. The Mississippi. Oklahoma, where the wind comes sweeping down the plain. They've even changed the song. Now it's Oklahoma, where the rain comes sweeping down the plain. To help explain what's going on from Louisiana up, I'm going to cover Heliophysics 101. Ain't nobody got time for that. Well, sweet brown, I, I think you better make time. Or else you're going to run out of time. Five minutes from now, just remember that five minutes ago, you used to think the solar system looked like this. Ancient scholars who observed the precession of the equinox provided a simpler explanation than a wobbling earth. They said that our sun curves through space, moving in a great orbit of its own, pulling the earth and other planets along with it. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. about to experience the awe and mystery that reaches from the inner mind to the outer limits. As a professor of heliophysics here in Colorado, I remind people about heliophysics as a heliophysician and heliophysiognomy and the heliophysiology, which says we all know we spin at approximately the Earth rotates approximately 1,000 miles an hour spinning around. Meanwhile, rotating around the sun about 70,000 kilometers per hour, about 50,000 miles an hour, but the sun isn't stationary, is it? No. You know the current solar system model, the sun and all the planets rotating around it? Yes, well, but we all know the sun isn't stationary, but we don't put this in the picture of us with the sun in the middle and us just lazily orbiting around this sun. But the sun is shooting! And it's like a rocket ship. The sun's velocity is currently calculated approximately 134 miles per second, or listen, uh, 482,000 miles an hour, almost a half a million miles an hour. Wow. Which means 34 hours, we travel over 11 million miles a day, whether we're awake or asleep. That's heliophysics. Which means we will have gone a million miles since we started this call half a million miles 
the sun goes, shooting through the universe, through the Milky Way, towing us, spinning at a thousand miles an hour, rotating around the sun at 50,000 miles an hour, but it's being dragged along by the sun at half a million miles an hour. So in other words, we are right now, this instant, approximately, oh, five, six hundred miles farther away than when I started this sentence. That's pretty wild. Mark, this is really fascinating. You want to talk about supersonic flight or a mothership? We're on it. Heliophysics 101 in five minutes or less. Just a quick nod to all the flat earthers here, and you're perfectly welcome to I entertain all ideas, and it's actually quite convincing mathematically impossible that the earth is curved. Pop quiz. Name the four ships of Christopher Columbus. Oh sure, everybody knows those. The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. You do not know the name of the fourth ship because it fell off the side of the fell earth. Off the side fell of off the, the side of the, of the earth. Of the earth. Seriously, in, in a twilight zone world, what if we found out the Earth is not a globe and really is flat after all? What if? However, that would throw this whole film out the window and certainly this demonstration. Not to mention any part of my story where I'm from a galaxy far, far away, or that the USS Arcturus is currently in geosynchronous orbit above your spinning globe. So, for now, let's just go with it. Let's just go with it that the Earth is a round spinning ball hurtling through the galaxy. Case in point, as you can see, the Sun is dragging us along by our North Pole. So we're actually on our side. As the sun drags us along, BTW it wants to grab our current magnetic north pole from now 500 miles to the northwest in Siberia. And the geographical axis wants to right itself up like a gyroscope. The sun grabs magnetics, gravity, assuming gravity exists. The jury is still out on that one, I'm not kidding. So we're actually on our sides, which is the main point to remember during the rest of this film. Now before somebody wants to post a comment insulting my intelligence, meanwhile blatantly revealing their kindergarten level thereof, you know who you are. Magnetic North has zero effect on our geographical axis. Seriously? Pop quiz, Einstein. What do you think the sun yanks us through space by? A grappling hook attached to a barber pole outside of Santa's workshop at our permanent top of the planet? Listen, in 2011, dozens, listen, dozens of airports had to shut down because airplanes couldn't land on runways which were no longer where their instruments said they were because in 2011 the magnetic 
North Pole shifted 40 miles that year. I'm going to back up just a moment because there's a lot of talk about polar shifting. I would like to state for the record the poles are not going to shift. Just ask CBS or CNN, they'll tell you the poles aren't going to shift. That's because they already have. Which is why dozens, listen, in 2011, dozens of airports had to close down because airplanes couldn't land on runways, which were no longer where the instruments said they were because the North Pole shifted 40 miles that year. Dozens of airports had to close and recalibrate their instruments. But the poles aren't shifting. In 2013, last year, North Pole racing a mile a day towards Siberia. Wait a minute. In 2011, it moved 40 miles. In 2013, 365? This is exponential. This is more than it's moved since they started uh, tracking magnetic North Pole in the, early, in the late 1800s when that guy with the, you know, the, the mush dogs discovered right. the magnetic North right. Pole up there. Well, it moved, you know, short 10, 20 miles over 70 years now, 365 years, that was last year. Several years ago, I made a film demonstrating this in great detail, which I'd love it if you go watch. I put the link in the description box below, where I proposed that instead of the precession of the equinoxes, 26,000 year journey as we wobble 23 and a half degrees on our axis, that based on all available current data, the Earth was rather at 40 to 49 degrees axial tilt. That the Earth is currently in a heliophysical axial flux and how this could possibly explain every single anomaly currently happening on planet Earth. So, as moves magnetic north, which is now in Siberia, also, this also shifts the bottom, which is Antarctica. Okay? So now, just using 365 and 40 miles, the North Pole moved reportedly in 2011, 365 in 2013. That's 405 miles towards Siberia. And it's showing no sign of slowing down. Now, when you drag the top of the planet from the North Pole, the Barber Pole, north 405 miles towards Siberia, that means now everything on the other side, including Alaska, is now how many miles farther south? 405 miles, using this example, correct? Correct. This would give Alaska a record heat wave in the winter, similar temperatures to those of Arizona. Then you would have San Francisco, now 405 miles south, which would put you right at San Diego, where the tuna crabs used to swim, and the sea slugs that are washing up. This would put the Oregon sea lions, the California sea lions in Oregon, 405 miles south, back in the San Francisco Bay. The current axial tilt of the Earth is calculated approximately 49 degrees. Okay, out of 360, you might go, well, big deal, Mark. That's only an extra 26 degrees. 26? That's more than double our normal tilt to take 26,000 years. And in three years, we've more than doubled our tilt. This answers every single question that they won't tell you on mainstream news. There's not one of these issues that isn't attributable to where you live is now in a different place than where you used to live. Stay tuned. Now, a lot of people didn't like my explanation of how the sun was trying to grab magnetic north, thereby pulling us off our axial tilt, which is as bad as arguing about global warming versus climate change. Is it man-made or is it natural? Meanwhile, happening all around us, and the point is that something's happening.
Even the UN agrees with that. 2014, they came out with their climate change report after years of study and millions and millions of dollars. And it was two pages long. I have the cover right here. And it said two words. We're screwed. 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 I don't know how many Sandys or Boulder, Colorado, West Virginia thousand year floods or 23 volcanoes erupting in the same day or quake swarms you can watch and sweep under the oh nothing's happening out of the ordinary rug. Maybe I should have told him the Planet X story that Planet X has passed the rings of Saturn and is due in August and that the gravitational pull of Nibiru has knocked us off course and out of orbit and off our axis. Maybe they would have liked that one better, I don't know. Then again, Planet X, not my field, at least heretofore. Stay tuned. The Sun! How many of you heard of Planet X or Nibiru, the other side of the Sun, the red-brown dwarf, which is apparently uh, intersects with the Earth every 3,600 years, shoots uh, iron rain at us, which burns up in our atmosphere, looking like meteorites. No, no, not my field. Apparently, Planet X, Nibiru, the return of Quetzalcoatl, can only currently be seen in the Southern Hemisphere. And for all my searching, I was only able to find this shot from a bedroom window in New Zealand, but if you look carefully, you should be able to catch a glimpse of it. However, as I mentioned, I entertain all ideas, and just in the past month, I've seen some very convincing photos and films coming mostly out of the Southern Hemisphere, of course, Project Wormwood in Antarctica, some of the webcam footage from the government's webcam. Of course, then they always shut it off and have technical difficulties. But it certainly looks like there's something strange in the sky. Also, comment after comment. Well, then things would look different. The sun would be in a different place and... Guess what? It is! Stay tuned. The Inuit Eskimos in Alaska know all about it. A film was recently released where they tell how the sky has changed. The stars are in a different place. The sun does not rise and set where it used to. <laughs> Stay tuned. They start saying our sun does not rise where it used to. This is something that we should be concerned about. Elders they interviewed across the north all say the same thing. Their sky has changed. The sun seems higher than in years gone past, says Elder Joanna C. Carpick of Pengnertung. The heat of the sun gets hotter sooner. The sun, the stars, and the moon are all changing, affecting the temperature of the sea, even the way the wind blows. 
Enoki Adami of Ikalawit says he wonders if his world has shifted or tilted north.